Hello, my name is Bill Boyd, and I'm the chair of the business law section for the Bar Association. I'm here today with David Walker, and we are here to make a proposal to the Board of Governors with regard to a request that the Board of Governors include in its affirmative legislation for 2023, the Uniform Limited Liability Company Act. The, the work of the business law section with regard to this act um, is really with the limited liability company committee of the business law section. That committee has been working for the last several months with regard to reviewing a uniform act uh, developed by the Uniform Law Commission. The LLC committee is made up of eight former members of the business law section and includes both David and me, as well as Frank Carroll, Matt Dore, Nick Roby, Laura Schmidt, Scott Van Voren, Mark Ward, and Greg Wilcox, as well as from the Secretary of State's office, Carl Dietz. And I should mention that Laura Schmidt, who is from Sioux City, is a new board of member or board of governor member who is joining the board uh, at the June meeting. So congratulations, Laura. Um, the LLC committee has been studying the act. We met on a weekly basis for over two months and have uh, and which resulted in the uh, recommendation that's before the Board of Governors today. A little background with regard to the uh, proposal that is being made by the business law section. It's a uniform act that's being proposed. It's, it's been developed by the Uniform Law Commission. And if you look at our Iowa code, you will see that there are a number of uniform acts that Iowa has adopted that are based on products of the Uniform Laws Commission. Each state has commissioners appointed to serve on the commission. And in Iowa, we have three commissioners, including David Walker. And David is not only a commissioner, but he has been very active with regard to the development of the Uniform Limited Liability Company Act at the national level. And in fact, chaired the committee that drafted the, the, um, the uniform legislation that, that we are considering. So we've been able to take advantage of David's expertise throughout the process, which we greatly appreciate. This Uniform Act, and it's in particular, uh, Iowa currently does have a Uniform Limited Liability Company Act. It was based on a 2006 version that the ULC developed. We adopted it in Iowa in 2008. Uh, the Uniform Law Commission came out with a, basically a revised Uniform Act in 2013 which is what our focus has been on and what our proposal is based on. This 2013 uh, version of the act has been uh, embraced by many states. We have now at least 16 states that have adopted the act, including nearby to us, Wisconsin and Arkansas. So it is something that has um, uh, been supported by other states and that we as a committee and as a business law section thought would make uh, great sense for the state to adopt. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to David, who's going to provide a summary of kind of the process with regard to the ULC, as well as the uh, highlights with regard to the act. Thank you, Bill, and, and uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to the uh, members of the Board of, of Governors uh, about this legislation and uh, on any occasion. The, uh, <clears throat> I was the chair of the uh, LLC drafting committee that um, published uh, as approved by the conference, the 2006 version. Uh, the 2006 version was in some respects a second generation LLC act, the Uniform Law Commission had published a Limited Liability Company Act in the mid-90s. But um, as with anything, whether it's cars, technology, uh, software, computers, um, the law develops at a fairly rapid pace in response to specific situations and opportunities. And we at the Uniform Law Commission uh, don't jump with every change, but uh, where we see an issue, where we see uh, a desirability for renewed attention and, and uh, uniformity and where it's practicable to think that uniformity could significantly be accomplished, 
uh, the ULC Act. Iowa has actually adopted more than 70 uniform acts, particularly in the business area with partnership, limited partnership, uh, limited liability companies, unincorporated nonprofit associations, and, and others. So um, sometime in uh, 2010, 2009, 2010, uh, we became aware of uh, you know, the tweaks that, that um, might be appropriate. We particularly became aware that uh, we realized we had drafted the Partnership Act that Iowa has between the late 80s and, and the mid-90s, culminating in 1997 with the adoption of the Limited Liability Partnership provisions. The Limited Partnership Act was one that already uh, uh, was attentive to the increasing number of inter-entity transactions. Uh, the Limited Partnership Act was published in 2001. Uh, unincorporated Nonprofit Association was revised afterwards. And what we realized is that we have uh, the same architecture, which is very practitioner and user-friendly. We're addressing so many of the same issues, uh, whether it's uh, definitions, uh, relations with the Secretary of State, formation filings, uh, relations to third parties, relationship between and among, whether it's members, partners, whomever. <clears throat> but we haven't always said it in the same way. And where you don't say things in the same way, uh, people infer that there are differences. Those were not intended. So one of the reasons for what we call the harmonization effort, of which I was a member, though not chair, was to examine if we were saying the same thing, did we say it in the same way, and what was the best way in which to say it. Uh, so we were also clarifying language as, as needed. Uh, our purpose was not to make substantive changes, but to be clear about what we were saying and to be consistent across our unincorporated organization act. What we were also doing is increasingly working with the American Bar Association's Corporate Laws Committee <clears throat> reflecting the uh, growing number of inter-entity transactions, particularly between corporations and limited liability companies, but uh, also with limited partnerships and and uh, uh, other other entities as, as well. And so the ABA was a uh, co-partner uh, in our harmonization uh, effort, uh, particularly uh, working with us was uh, a lawyer from uh, East, uh, Bill Clark, uh, who was a, a member and, and driving force in the Corporate Laws uh, Committee, also with respect to nonprofit organizations. So we intended to facilitate, recognize and facilitate those transactions. Uh, with all that, I want to say that uh, a lot has not changed. Uh, the, the architecture that with which you are familiar and other and business lawyers are familiar is unchanged. It's a it's a, a useful architecture that crosses acts, whether partnership, limited partnership, LLC, uh, limited cooperatives, and, and others. Uh, there are, uh, it remains uh, a creature of contract when you form uh, a limited liability company. So the operating agreement is crucial. Uh, this is not something that is subject to extensive legi legislative uh, regulation and, and uh our purpose in drafting was to be user user friendly. There's three or four areas I'd call particular to your attention, and I'll mention uh, briefly shortly. Uh, one is Section 105, which is currently 49.110 in our act, dealing with the operating agreement. The operating agreement does not have to be in writing. It can be oral. It can be implied for conduct, but it is the contract. It is the the agreement. Uh, between and among members of the limited liability company addressing their duties, their rights, their obligations, measures of performance, how the, how the operating agreement is to be amended, and uh, so forth. Um, the next section we, we uh, looked at uh, was section 409 on the standards of conduct by members, and particularly the, the uh, duty of, of care, uh, the I can borrow from the music man, the phraseology of which we changed to comport with the language in the Uniform Partnership Act and the Uniform Limited Partnership Act, but with respect to which no substantive change was in, intended. Uh, Section 503 deals with a fairly arcane area of practice. Uh, uh, practitioners in this area tend to be specialists. It deals with charging orders 
the manner in which uh, a judgment creditor can obtain a charging enter, uh, charging order on the transferable interest, which is the economic stream, the interest in distributions when as and if they are declared. Uh, and in some states, in some cases, if the charging order is not reasonably likely to pay the judgment debt within a reasonable period of time, foreclosure. Uh, Article 10 was uh, uh, given a substantial uh, rewording uh, it, in, uh, in conjunction with the American Bar Association so that it, it jived very well with the uh, merger interest exchange conversion domestication provisions of our Chapter 490, the Model Business Corporation Act. And um, uh, <clears throat> that re reflects in particular the partnership between the ABA and uh, uh, the ULC. Some default provisions were, were changed. Let me look at a couple of these provisions I mentioned. The, um, the definition and purposes of the operating agreement remain the same. And except as noted in that section 105, the, it, this act is a default act. It only applies where the operating agreement does not otherwise provide. Uh, the effort was to make an act uh, in the shadow of which operating agreements could be drafted, uh, but in the provisions of the act to reflect what would generally be the reasonable expectation and thinking and planning of, of lawyers and, and clients. <clears throat> Some changes in uh, Section 105 were made to emphasize that an LLC uh, is a contract and, and, and that freedom of contract is the dominant underlying uh, principle. So uh, it, the lawyers and, and, and clients are able, uh, and in particularly where there are uh, negotiations involved, they are able to uh, alter or even eliminate specific aspects of the duty of loyalty. Where would they do that? He would do that where they wanted to rely upon specific negotiated contractually expressed duties, contractual duties, and not leave it to the more vague language derived from the common law, <clears throat> which is a uh, can be a, a source of, of litigation in contrast to the specificity with which one can express duties and obligations and rights in, in an agreement. We did something like that just a year ago in, in the uh, uh, Model Business Corporation, Chapter 490. Um, uh, Iowa has not had a uh, provision that was in the 2006 Act on Special Litigation Committees. Special Litigation Committee is, is uh, uh, something that we have in the uh, corporate chapter 490, but uh, this provision is differently and, and uh, strictly and carefully expressed so as to ensure disinterestedness, no financial interest, and independence, uh, objectivity, uh, if the LLC chooses to have one. It's an optional provision. Uh, members of the LLC can opt out of that provision and to decide that they are not going to have a special litigation committee. Otherwise, it's a default provision. <clears throat> the, um, with respect to standards of conduct, the relevant section would be 489.409C uh, uh, or 3 on the, on the uh, duty of care. The language is changed to be the same as is stated currently in 486A, our Partnership Act, and 488, our Limited Partnership Act, namely to uh, refrain from engaging in grossly negligent uh, conduct, uh, intentional harm uh, to members and the entity and uh, knowing violation of, of law. It, uh, it seems like a, uh, a low standard uh, Iowa uh, drew from and the 2006 Act drew from the language of the Model Business Corporation Act uh, which is an ordinary care statement, but uh, the the uh, 4093, as, as uh, presently in our law, says subject to the business judgment rule. That had a meaning to business lawyers, derived from a plethora of cases beginning in Delaware, but widely adopted, widely recognized, uh, namely that uh, 
uh, it's a gross negligence standard and one only violated that duty of care by uh, failing to make any, any reasonable effort to find out the facts and, and make a at least a rational judgment. Uh, and so <clears throat> the trouble with that standard is that it only applies where a judgment was made, uh, where there was deliberation and an exercise of judgment. In a lot of situations, uh, there isn't judgment, but there may be a failure of ordinary care, and no one, absolutely no one, wanted business relationships at the member management level to be subject to a, an ordinary negligence standard. That's why you have insurance. That's why indemnification provisions are in place. And so uh, what we did was to harmonize the language with the uh, partnership and Limited Partnership Act. The last on uh, charging orders, uh, there's a special provision for single member limited liability companies, SM LLCs as they're called, where a uh, single member of uh, an LLC uh, suffers uh, a, a judgment and becomes therefore uh, a judgment debtor. Um, <clears throat> The uh, court may order a charging order requiring the LLC to make distributions uh, pursuant to the charging order if those distributions are not likely within a reasonable time to pay off, pay off the judgment debt, uh, a court may order foreclosure. Uh, someone, a creditor who does foreclose uh, on the charging order does not become a member becomes a transferee, is not entitled to attend meetings, is not entitled to vote, is not entitled to demand inspection of, of uh, documents until uh, uh, dissolution has, has occurred. And the reason for that is that uh, the Unincorporated Organization Acts uh, respect what is known as uh, you pick your partner, you choose with whom you will be co-owners, whether of a partnership or co-members of an, of an LLC. You don't have a judgment creditor showing up and say, hi, I'm your new member. Uh, what are we voting on today? Uh, but you know, that, that reasoning has no applicability where there's only one member. So a provision added to uh, 489.503, it would be section 503 of the act, would say that if there is foreclosure of uh, a, a charging order against the sole member of an LLC, the judgment creditor on foreclosure gets the entire interest, not just the transferable interest entitling the creditor to the earnings flow, but also the management interest. And with that, I'll turn it back to, to uh, Bill to uh, speak to some unique provisions that we retained and one that we did not. Thank you, David. If you look at our current Iowa uh, Limited Liability Company Act, you'll see that there are certain provisions in there that do not match up with the uh, 2006 Uniform uh, Limited Liability Company Act. And so we see those as their unique provisions. They're provisions that the Limited Liability Committee um, thought were important to maintain in Iowa. They were developed even before our 2008 Act. And as the committee, this year looked at the uh, the unique provisions uh, all but one of them uh, we decided should continue to stay in the um, in the proposed legislation the one exception relates to a provision that that addresses mergers between cooperatives and limited liability companies uh, there's a specific provision uh, 489.115 that that addresses those type of mergers in looking at the proposed legislation and the Uniform Act, we thought it was no longer necessary to have a, a provision that just spoke to those type of mergers because the, uh, the Uniform Act is broad enough to cover those type of mergers without a, um, a unique provision. And we've had discussions with attorneys and um, representatives from co-ops associations with regard to this particular provision. And we believe that they're they're fine with uh, removing that provision from the um, from the legislation. So we're not including that in the proposal. Uh, we are, as I said, including all the other unique provisions. And we have a list here of some of those provisions. Uh, one of them is in uh, 489.201. 
It's the concept that uh, you can have a formation of a limited liability company without the need for a member. Um, that's that's different than what the Uniform Act is, and um, but it's what our current law is, and so we're going to continue to maintain that. Uh, we have a provision at 489.407A, which is actually a provision that the real estate section proposed a number of years ago and was adopted in our current statute. It, it's, it addresses issues with regard to the transfer of real estate, and the uh, committee is recommending that that provision continue to stay in the Act. Uh, 489.604 is a provision that addresses the member's power to dissociate. Uh, it's a unique provision. And again, the thought was to keep it in the um, in the proposed legislation since we currently have it uh, in our current act. And then finally, we have a, a series of sections or part of the act that addresses professional limited liability companies. Uh, they are not they are not uniform provisions. They are, but they are based on our professional corporation statute. So. When you look at the professional corporation statute, you will see that basically the same provisions you see for the professional limited liability companies, except you're dealing with a different type of entity. Um, we have we are proposing to continue to keep those provisions in the statute that is the professional limited liability company provisions, but we are also going to update them. Um, in 2003, there was an amendment made to the professional corporation statute. Uh, that was not moved, the amendment was not also made to the professional limited liability company provisions. And so at this time, we're, we're um, recommending that those amendments be, or those changes be made. And they basically are addressing a situation in which you might have a professional limited liability company. The owners may decide at some point that they no longer want to practice a profession. So they no longer really have to be a professional limited liability company, but they do want to continue as a entity, a legal entity uh, to do other types of activities. And this, these amendments or changes to the professional limited liability company uh, provisions will allow that to occur. And with that, I will uh, turn this back to David. Thank you, thank you Bill. Uh, in, in this uh, updated version of the Uniform Limited Liability Company Act, um, there was a continuation of an effort that's been developing over several years to examine our business legislation uh, and see where there are differences that are merited and important and deserve to be retained and expressed. Uh, examples might be the the very nature of a limited liability company as a creature of contract, in contrast to a corporation which uh, traditionally has reflected much more broadly distributed uh, ownership of people in different locations from the uh, paradigm small three to five member uh, or sole member uh, LLC. Uh, so that there's much more legislative regulation, uh, attention to uh, notices, communications, uh, meetings, votes, and, and the like. <clears throat> so um, sometimes those differences are important, and uh, sometimes, you know, what, why are they different? Um, the filings, the, the requirements for documents, uh, the availability of a certificate of existence, the the content of a biennial report, um, uh, the relations with the Secretary of State's office on correcting filings, amending filings, uh, um, and, 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 and the like. And so uh, it was very good to have you know, uh, Carl Dietz, Director of Business Services at the Secretary of State's office, just as we had had uh, <clears throat> a member of, of the uh, uh, Secretary of State's office with us in the drafting committee reviewing the Model Business Corp Corporation Act. In, in other areas, uh, administrative dissolutions, uh, we made the decision uh, uh, in the LLC Act uh, to follow literally the language uh, that we had just approved most recently uh, in the the Iowa Business Corporation Act. Substantively, it was the same, but it expressed uh, in a way now familiar with corporations, there are probably three times the number of LLCs in Iowa as there are uh, uh, corporations. It is clearly the, the entity of choice. So we thought, well, 
for practitioners and for members of the Secretary of State staff, why should the provisions on ad administrative dissolution be, be the same? Uh, and and uh, why should they be different? Excuse me. And you know, likewise, the same with with um, uh, foreign uh, limited liability companies seeking to be authorized to do business in 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 Iowa. We uh, reviewed that extensively last uh, three years with the Corporate Laws Committee. Uh, interestingly enough, the Chapter 15 of the the Model Business Corporation Act borrowed substantially, even in some places, most places, word for word, from the Uniform Law Commission's uh, harmonized uh, business entity acts like the Limited Liability Company Act. And so we've given it the, the latest review um, just uh, two or three years ago in the Corporate Laws Committee. and. Uh, um, uh, decided to, to come port to to uh, make the chapter of the Limited Liability Company Act, with Chapter 9, Article 9, uh, be the same as uh, Article 15 of the Iowa Business Corporation Act, uh, with, with uh, the same tailoring uh, for Iowa practitioners, business clients, and the Secretary of State's office as we had done that. We think this um, makes uh, for fewer uh, mistakes by oversight, uh, easier practice, easier administration by the Secretary of State's office. And I think that'll be w w well received. Um, with that, I'm going to turn back to Bill uh, to speak to a particular issue uh, dealing with uh, a fundamental change. Thank you, David. Um, during our review of the proposed legislation, uh, we discussed the fact that um, under our current Uniform Partnership Act, there's not specific authority for a partnership to be able to merge into a, um, or convert into a, um, a limited liability company. And so our committee discussed uh, that, that particular issue uh, under the uniform law that we're proposing, that type of conversion will be able to occur under the new act, under the Limited Liability Company Act, but still we identify that it's gonna be necessary to make amendments to the Partnership Act to allow for this actual conversion, this type of conversion to occur. And that's, we need authority under the, uh, the Partnership Act to be able to, to actually effectuate that type of conversion. So separate from this, our plan is as a business law section to, is to also uh, prepare a proposal, a, proposed amendments to the Partnership Act that will allow for those type of conversions to occur. And we just wanted to uh, alert you that uh, you'll be hearing us from us on that uh, type of proposal also in the future. Um, and with that, that's that gives you a summary of our uh, the proposed legislation. Again, the business law section is requesting that the Board of Governors approve the Uniform Limited Liability Company Act, the 2013 version as proposed by the business law section to have it be part of the affirmative legislation for the Bar Association for the 2023 General Assembly. Thank you very much.